That's the reason so many people start exploring graduate school, because it gives you a chance to get back on a way of measuring <laughs> success that you're comfortable with. And you know, <laughs> being out there on that blank canvas is a very scary place to be. Indeed, it's very scary. And so, you know, if I want to get more comfortable, I can go get into a, gra a graduate school program and get my master's. The reality is, though, when you get the master's, you're right back out on the blank canvas again. If you want to be an innovative, creative, entrepreneurial individual who defines their own life, who sets their own goals, who measures their own success, it's a scary place. And yet it is the most invigorating way to live is that nobody tells you how to define success. Nobody tells you that you should work in this job or that you should get promoted here or that you need to learn this skill set. You have to look down deep inside and say, what do you really want to do? And nobody's probably ever asked you that because your parents told you you needed to go to be successful in school and go to college and get your degree. Well, in the next 20, 30, 40 years, should you expect some of the biggest and largest companies in the continent to come from Rwanda? Sure, absolutely. What has the experience working with President Kagame been like? <laughs> And by the way, I love your background. Oh, yeah. It's a, uh, it's a uh, in Tory Dancers. What's the story behind it? I, I bought it from an artist in Kigali, a um, young Rwandan artist um, uh, several years ago, probably 10 years ago. Wow. So, That's a long time. Yeah. I've been in Rwanda a long time. <laughs> I mean, Rwanda is quite an interesting place. Yeah, fascinating place. Where are you from? I'm from Tanzania. Mm. Yeah, but I, I study at African Leadership University in Rwanda. Sure. What year are you? I'm almost graduating my final year. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, but I've got to admit, you know, with graduating comes the fear and the worry of what happens next. And, and... <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's something sure. that a lot of college students face. And just today morning, my friend reached out to me and he also had the same worries. Sure. You'll figure it out. Yeah, we it's, hope so. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things to do. Lots of opportunities. And I mean, and we are glad that the organizations like Bridge to Rwanda that help students figure out how that life is going to be like when they graduate. Sure. What do you want to do? I'll definitely still be doing podcasting storytelling mm -hmm. and maybe thinking of going for a grad program sure yeah but sure even, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out right well one day at a time one day at a time so what what inspired you to start bridge to rwanda oh um you know coming to rwanda and meeting uh the people and meeting president kagami and I came to Rwanda in 2004 for the first time. I met a, an Anglican bishop named John Rushahana. Everybody called him Bishop John. And he served in the northern part of the country. Um, he had grown up a uh, refugee in Uganda most of his life, came back after the genocide. And, um, you know, my background is I'm an investment banker and an entrepreneur. And... Um, you know, I was trained early on to try to identify outstanding entrepreneurs, talented leaders who want to do something interesting. Um, and um, and I met John Rushahana, uh, and I, I didn't know anything about Rwanda. I didn't know anything about Africa. What I was interested in is he was um, he was I assessed very quickly. He was an extraordinary entrepreneur. He had come back into the country after the genocide. He was building medical clinics and schools and churches and businesses. And he was, he was finding partners and he was making a difference. And I realized he was an extraordinary entrepreneurial talent. And um, I was looking for something new and different that was outside my historical uh, frame of reference. And so... So he invited me to come to Rwanda and see what Rwanda was doing to 
recover from the genocide and begin the process of building the country. And um, so I was happy to get on a plane and come to Rwanda and was totally inspired by what Rwanda was attempting to do. Um, he, uh, the bishop was building a secondary school for genocide orphans and, and he had a goal of making it one of the best academic schools in the country to prove that every child is redeemable. So my first project was helping him raise money to do that. But the bishop constantly was uh, encouraging me to find an opportunity to build businesses. He said, you're a business guy, you're an investment banker, you build businesses, you've helped other people build businesses. What Rwanda needs are businesses and uh, to create jobs and opportunities and careers for our young people and you should be building businesses in Rwanda. And so the first business I became interested in was microfinance. And I helped found uh, what is now the Owego Bank, microfinance bank in Rwanda. Um, so those were my first two projects for the first three or four years was raising money for the, to build a school and putting together and organizing a new microfinance bank in the country and um, you know that that helped me have a better understanding of what business and how people made a living and what were the challenges and what were the issues that they had to deal with in the process of, of doing that uh, I met President Kagame and we became friends and I met him in Kigali and he came to the U.S. and and uh, spent a weekend with me and some friends and you know you can't be around President Kagame without being inspired and and um, realizing that, that the opportunity there was this very serious determination to build a great country and um, you know the idea of participating even in a very small way in helping someone build a country was too much of a, you know, an opportunity not to invest more time and energy in. So I became uh, friends with the president. I saw him pretty frequently. And he, in 2008, he created uh, an advisory council of international friends and he invited me to join it. So that's, that kind of created some momentum on getting involved with, figuring out what I could do to help Rwanda achieve its vision. How was your first experience like being in Rwanda? You know, I had never been in Africa. I had never been in a developing country. You know, I grew up in the United States. I had done uh, some international work primarily in Europe. Um, so I was comfortable um, working outside the United States, but I, I had no real concept of the way people lived or the issues, challenges in developing countries. Um, and so, you know, I was struck by two things. One, the horror of the genocide to see the very deliberate, very intentional way that Rwanda was addressing those issues with, um, with forgiveness and with, um, uh, reconciliation and with unity with trying to pull uh, people together after a horrible um, experience like that. Um, you know, I didn't know any other countries who had been through anything like that or was where the leadership was working so deliberately to, to address it and to bring a sense of uh, justice and mercy and unity back to the country. So that was, by itself, that was extremely unusual and very fa and fascinating and, and inspiring. Uh, at the same time, there was clearly a vision um, of how do we build a country? And in the first conversations I had with President Kagame and some of the leaders, <clears throat> I realized they were very serious about nation building and that they had spent a lot of time studying uh, other countries that had come out of poverty 
and out of uh, difficult situations and had built successful globally competitive economies that had lifted their countries. And specifically, they shared a lot with me about the Asian tigers, about Singapore and Taiwan and Hong Kong and and um, you know what was it that those countries did starting in the 1960s and 70s that over a 40, 50 year period lifted them to being very high income, globally competitive businesses. And what I realized that the Rwandans had made a very serious study of those countries. And they, uh, they had a relatively clear picture of what were the principles, what were the primary priorities if you were going to build, you know, a country that basically started with little or nothing and build something over a few decades that was going to be a significant player. And so that totally fascinated me, the idea of, of building a country and, and following the blueprints of the Asian tigers. Um, and so I was drawn into Rwanda's vision and momentum of what are the things we have to do in order for that to happen. And um, the president and the leaders through that advisory council were very clear about how they thought international friends could be helpful. And Rwanda is definitely hailed as one of the most, one of the fastest growing economies in the continent. And given the dark history that they came from, I mean, one can only agree and appreciate the work that has been done into lifting the country from such horrors. Yeah, absolutely. What has the experience working with President Kagame been like? What type of a man is? You know, he's a person with extraordinary vision. He he sees the future and what he what he believes, what he thinks Rwanda wants and what it needs, and how do, how do, how does he build a country that benefits everybody? Uh, how does it compete with other countries and other economies around the world? So he has a very clear picture of what it is, um, w- where he want, he thinks the country should go. Um, he's very independent. You know, I appreciate the fact that he, he, you know, Rwandans think for themselves. They decide what's best for Rwanda. And, you know, they study the world. They look at the, around at everything that's available and everybody you can draw from. But they decide what they want, what their mission, what their goals are. And then they go off to achieve it. And, um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm an admirer of that independence um, and the vision that they have. Um, and then also in the, the discipline and the execution is that any if you're going to accomplish anything you have to be all in you have to be committed to it you have to to bring all your talents resources time and energy to accomplishing your goal and and that's that has been what I've seen in Rwanda's leadership not just with president Kagame but with um, leaders in every sector in every area is that people have a vision and they ha- have a willingness to to invest their time, energy, and effort to accomplish their goals. And it's so admirable how the people of Rwanda love President Kagame. (laughs) Sure. It's certainly understandable from if you look at where the country has come in the last 25, 30 years. Leadership is 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 a rare thing in the world. You know, leaders who people trust, leaders who get things done, people who make people's lives better, um, people, you know, leaders who make people safe uh, and and provide the, the resources to improve their lives. Um, those are rare individuals. Uh, they're rare in Africa. They're rare all over the world. And so um, when you look at the results of Rwanda over the last 25 years and you realize um that that's I did all of those results are identified with President Kagame and his leadership and the the team he's assembled to help run the country. You understand why um, people appreciate him being in that role. Given the 
amount of time that you've spent with him and you've worked with him and have conversations with him, what are some of the characters that you think African leaders should emulate from him? Um, you know, I think, I think uh, from the very beginning, we, we, we talked about what are the priorities, what's important in order to build a country, what are some of the essential <clears throat> elements that have to be, be there? And we talked a lot about security and we talked about a zero tolerance of corruption uh, as two things that even when Rwanda was just starting with very little resources, um, the fact that, that it had the ability to make its citizens and people who visited Rwanda feel safe um, was critical. I mean, if you're trying to build an economy, if you want to attract foreign investors, if you want to um, if you want to move ahead, people, you have to start with some pretty basics. And one of those is, do people feel safe? And that means the country feels safe. Do you feel safe in your home? Do you feel safe on the streets? Do you feel like you're going to be okay? Because you can waste an awful lot of time, energy, and effort protecting yourself if you don't feel that you're safe. And the second was this concept of zero tolerance of corruption is that um, that corruption is kind of a um, an insidious cancer that undermines people investing and building and developing is that the idea that somehow uh, this is going to be effectively stolen from you or taken from you is that it undermines um, the interest. And so I, the, the Rwandans understood from watching the Asian tigers that being able to attract foreign investors and foreign organizations to come to your country and to operate was an accelerator to improving the country. And that the two things a foreigner, a foreign investor or a foreign organization who wants to come and work within your country, they need to feel safe and they feel like they're not going to be held up by a corrupt official or corrupt government. Those were things that, you know, those were not, those were things that even at the early stages of Rwanda, Rwanda had the capacity to make both of those happen. And it became a competitive advantage when you compared Rwanda to many other countries where people could choose to go, come or go, is that Rwanda being safe and having zero tolerance for corruption gave it a competitive advantage. People would come here to Rwanda um, because of those two things. And so, um, you know, working with the president and the government, it was a matter of understanding what do you want? Well, if you want foreign entity, if you want to be a place where foreign organizations will come and invest and build and participate, what are the things they care about? and then being able to actually deliver on those priorities. Yeah, I mean, safety and zero tolerance on corruption is definitely, I mean, are definitely two of the most important things that I think most African countries usually don't focus a lot on. And hence it puts them in a, well, it, it, it makes them lose the competitive advantage that they would otherwise have gained. Right, absolutely. Why, why young people? Why did you choose to focus on working with young people? Well, in those very early conversations with uh, the President's Advisory Council, with the ministers and with the president, what they identified were three things that as an international friend of Rwanda that I could be helpful with. And they, they had garnered a lot of this from watching how what the Asians had done. The first one was, is that Ro Rwanda, any country needs a dense network of friends around the world in all sectors, in government, in military, in business, in education, in religion, is that the, a network of friends will pay dividends uh, over a long, long period of time. If people around the world understand, know you, they understand your vision. They they see what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you may be able to draw people into to assisting you, supporting you, encouraging you, um, 
but a lot of it is a, a lot of work is that you have to go around the world building friendships and you have to share what it is your vision is and what you're trying to do and encourage people to come visit, encourage people to come and invest or come spend time with you. So the first one was as an international friend is that I had a role in being an ambassador for Rwanda to introducing the country to people in all kinds of sectors all over the world. The second thing was, is that what they had learned from the Asian tigers was that if you wanna accelerate the economic growth of your country and the acceleration, the growth of jobs and prosperity, you need foreign investors to come and build businesses in your country. Foreign direct investment is the catalyst for accelerating economic growth. And foreign investors bring in capital, they bring in talent, they bring in standards, ways of doing business, networks, or global networks. And so to be able to welcome foreign investors to come into your country and to, to build you know, organizations, enterprises that will be more sophisticated than, than what has been there in the past is critical. So the second thing to do was build businesses in Rwanda and encourage other people to come build businesses. The third thing, which was equally, was tied to the second, was that at the end of the day, uh, you, you know, was, is the issue, the challenge of young talent, young people who are going to be able to run globally competitive businesses. And if you bring foreign investors in, I can tell you as somebody who's been doing foreign investment and encouraging other people, you have to have talent on the ground. And ideally, your talent would be indigenous young people. So that, you know, but you need a young person who can, is comfortable and confident and capable of working with people from all over the world. And so what the president and what we were asked to do initially was to create opportunities for promising Rwandan students to go study abroad while they were in college, whether it was undergraduate or graduate, help them create opportunities for them to go get a global experience with the idea that we, to get them back home because they would be, a, they would be uh, an attraction to foreign investors. If you knew you could work, if an American or a European or Asian could work with someone who had, was comfortable and confident in their culture, then that was, a, that was an essential element of why you would want to build your business there, is that you were going to have local talent that you knew you could work with. And uh, what they had learned from the Asians is that, you know, after 10 years of doing these two things, you would have most of these foreign-owned enterprises actually being led and managed by indigenous young talent. And that in 20 years or 30 years, that young talent would be buying out and starting their own businesses. And these industries would no longer be as foreign owned, they would be you know, indigenously owned. And this is what they had seen in Singapore and they had seen it in Korea and Hong Kong. And so the idea of foreign direct investment coupled with globally competitive, high capacity young talent was a catalyst for growth and a catalyst for economic development. So, you know, the, the government made it very clear to us that if we wanted to be helpful, if we wanted to do something that was going to bring positive results, would complement and support the vision Rwanda was trying to accomplish as a global friend, as an international friend, being an investor, encouraging investing, and also creating opportunities for young people to get the kind of training, education, exposure that they would need to be global leaders. That's the best. Th those were the areas where we could have the most impact. You know, the first five years, we started Bridge to Rwanda in 2007 to do those three things, be an ambassador for the country, expand the network of friends, encourage foreign direct investment, create opportunities for young people to get the kind of experience and education they would need. That was our mission when we started Bridge Rwanda. The first five or six years, 
we did a little bit of all of those things. We helped start some businesses. Uh, we had obviously invited lots of people to come visit Rwanda and share the story. But we were also working with uh, opportunities at that time to send students abroad. And I think at the time, in 2006, 7, 8, very few Rwandans were had the opportunity to get out of the country and to study abroad. Uh, there had not been a lot of people growing up in the country who had those opportunities. And so we started working with the government on one scholarship program. We later started the Bridge for Rwanda Scholars Program to create opportunities for Rwandan students to go to the best schools in the world. Um, and then we worked very, very hard to keep them connected to Rwanda and encourage them to come home and uh, build their careers. It sounds like the government of Rwanda has a very clear and proper plan that has been laid out and they're very effective when it comes to communicating that plan to individuals. And also the execution seems to be on the right path. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that was very, it's one of the attractions of, you know, why I and other international friends have come to Rwanda is because of the clarity of the vision is that, um, and that, that it's grounded in actual historical transformation in other countries around the world. I mean, this isn't, this is not, um, you know, it's not a pipe dream. It, it, it is based on actually studying the progress of countries in Asia and other countries and seeing what works and what doesn't work and then implementing that plan and aggressively recruiting friends around the world to participate in the process. And so, you know, it's very exciting. I mean, I'm a, a business guy, an entrepreneur business. You know, th this was these were opportunities to participate in in working with Rwanda to accomplish its goals at a scale and a opportunity that this doesn't exist most of the, most other places or times. So as a business guy, Rwanda Rwanda's population isn't huge, which means that right. if you are to create a business, then the market size wouldn't be as huge as if you were to create one, let's say, in, in Kenya or in Tanzania or in Nigeria or South Africa, sure. right? Countries that have a huge market size. So what is it about investments in Rwanda that makes investors want to come and invest in the country in terms of the business side of things? Sure. Well, I think it's it's the idea that um, that you have a government in your country that is encouraging innovation is encouraging new ideas, is encouraging um, entrepreneurship, uh, small business creation. Um, so, you know, all large businesses start out as a small business. Every, every business that operates multinational started out in one country. And so um, I think the, the attraction to Rwanda is that because of the safe, non-corrupt, supportive environment that exists there, that if you're going to start a business, if you can't make it work in Rwanda on a small scale, then the chances of you starting it up and starting getting it accomplished somewhere else is less likely. And so um, so I think that's one of the the attractions for why people would come and 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 put that business you know in Rwanda. I also think Clearly, Rwanda, if it's going to be successful, has to be uh, building enterprises that operate pan-African, regionally. You know, it has to be multinational. If it, as you said, Rwanda is a small market. If you build a, the biggest company in Rwanda, you're still not going to be a particularly large company. So it makes you begin to think early on, is it whatever you're building is that how does this transfer to other countries in the region or on the continent? Uh, I think you saw that in Singapore. Singapore is a tiny little country, and yet uh, many, many enterprises were started there. And if you're running a multinational organization, 
you have to have one place that's a headquarters. And it isn't necessarily where your biggest market is. It's where you can operate comfortably. You people can come in and out of it. People want to come there if you're going to gather people together. Uh, I think that Rwanda saw in Singapore, I think it saw the role of Switzerland or Belgium, you know, is, a, is countries that, that were themselves small, but played a very important role in regional or global uh, activities. And so I think Rwanda is very conscious of its size, of its locations. Um, you know, what are the industries that it can be as good as anybody in the world at? And so it doesn't try to compete in industries where it doesn't have at least an even playing field. So, you know, being the center where universities are is Rwanda's probably attracted more international universities to, to its country in the last 10, 12 years than any other country in Africa. Um, it is a center for conventions and meetings and, you know, 10 years ago, it wasn't even on the radar. It was because Rwanda looked at what Rwanda could do as well or better than other countries and chose those industries where it could have a competitive advantage or it certainly didn't have a disadvantage. So being knowledge-based, being technology-driven, you look at pharmaceuticals, you look at the fact that BioNTech has chosen to put the first vaccine manufacturing plant in Rwanda, well, that's the nature of pharmaceuticals is that you don't have to haul in heavy weight uh, importing raw products. And when you finish them and you, know, you send them out on an airplane. So Rwanda has been extraordinarily insightful and strategic about identifying those sectors and those enterprises and those opportunities where being a small centrally located country is not a disadvantage and in fact, in many cases is an advantage. And so, um, so you know, they have to, they pick and choose what they're gonna be good at based upon who they are and what their situation is. Wow, wow. I mean, that is really thought out. Yeah, right. <laughs> they're very impressive. Rwanda is a very impressive country. You're very serious about this economic growth and um, and what they're going to encourage. I mean, they 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 they're you know they're they're inspiring to work with because they've they've thought about a lot of things way before you know foreigners who show up have. So so they're they're fun to work with, and every every year they get better at what they do, and so. Um, so it's it's been a great ride to be, you know, a small part of it. And what makes it even more fascinating is the fact that it seems like they've answered all the questions already. Right? So when you come in and you have questions, you know, like, how about the market? How about infrastructures? How about this? It's like, well, this is the plan, right? And what's right. interesting is that they're not thinking about the next two or three years. I mean, they're thinking about the next 10 or 20 years down the line, right? Something that sure. most of us don't do, or right. most African leaders. So that's quite impressive. Yeah. No, I think, um, you know, they, they're, they're, as I said, they're fun to work with. They're, they're, uh, they're thoughtful, they're strategic. Um, they're very results driven. You know, there's, there's not a lot of um, um, time wasted on doing activities just for the show. Um, I think that they, they're very serious about attracting business and capital and they're going to have an impact on the country and and overall improve people's lives in the next 20 years should we expect some of the biggest companies in well in the next 20 30 40 years should we expect some of the biggest and largest companies in the continent to come from rwanda sure absolutely you know country companies come out of individuals small teams of people who develop a, a passion and a vision for serving a market, providing a product or a service. Um, there is, um, you know, where they could come from any country. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, what I learned as an investment banker and entrepreneur is that, that um, 
entrepreneurs are, it's a divine calling. You know, not everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. It's um, for everyone. That, that um, business can be very transformational um, and uh, you can do good with it. You know, it's a two edged sword. It can, can change people's lives. And I think that, um, that Rwanda's success in the long run will be about attracting individuals, both Rwandans and other Africans and other international who come to Rwanda and start enterprises that begin to grow. And they have the, the you know, growing great enterprises is both a, a function of vision and hard work. It's also a function of luck, you know, having the right product or service at the right time and place and things beginning to to pick up momentum. So uh, absolutely, I think Rwanda is going to be a center. But I, that doesn't mean that other countries won't themselves be that, you know, assuming they are encouraging entrepreneurship and and creative innovation to solve the problems of the continent. You describe yourself as an investment banker and entrepreneur, and you said that entrepreneurship isn't for everyone, which I agree. Right? I mean, because <clears throat> most of the times we want security. We want somewhere where we know, you know, there's, there's monthly payment and we don't have to worry about <laughs> anything else. <laughs> we just wake up, show, do the work, leave, and we are pretty much sorted and we are covered. But for entrepreneurs, well, you've got to be willing to take the risk, right? And 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 it's so uncertain because you don't know if you're going to succeed or not yet. You have to put in all your resources, all your time, all your effort, all your energy, and literally give it everything you've got, right? Right. So what has your experience as an entrepreneur been like? You know, I, I, um, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to own a business. I, I always wanted to be able to to build what I wanted to build. At the same time, I'm very conscious of needing experience and le learning lessons that, that becoming a, a business person is about keeping your learning curve very steep. It's about getting opportunities to run businesses, to uh, sell products, to build teams. And so my career was going back and forth between working in established companies where I was going to get a lot of training and a lot of opportunity and a lot of, of leadership. And then at the same time, trying to start a business and then going back and forth. So I, I was a, an accountant with KPMG, one of the big accounting firms. Um, you know, I was very fortunate. My wife had a very similar personal vision of wanting to be an entrepreneur and a business person. So at one point I was a partner with KPMG and we started a business importing ceiling fans from Hong Kong. And she ran that business, which was very entrepreneurial in our twenties. And then, um, and then later on, we both ended up in the securities business, investment banking business. And then we started another company that I ran it while she had a more stable job. And so um, I don't think the idea that if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you walk away from any job or employment is not really, you know, I don't necessarily think it's smart. I also don't think that it's the necessarily the best learning experience. If you get yourself, if you work for a company that's growing and where they give you a lot of responsibility early, the learning, the experience that you get working for somebody else in a larger, more better financial business, those experiences and those lessons learned are worth the time to do them because at some point you'll employ them in the future in a business of your own. So I'm, I, you know, my career path and a career path, for a lot of entrepreneurs is not an either or game. It's not, I'm going to work for somebody else and I'm going to have a nice salary. I didn't ever really work. I mean, obviously getting a salary is great. I was more interested in what am I learning working for somebody else? Is, is somebody giving me the responsibility to build a team, to serve a client, to build an enterprise? Um, and they, you know, working for them, I had, I had resources and opportunities that I wouldn't have had had I been all by myself. Um, and so you have to make that judgment. I mean, 
God kind of opens doors and he closes doors. And sometimes that opportunity is a chance to learn and to be part of something else uh, that will prepare you for, for another task 10 years later. And so, um, so, you know, I, I never lost the desire to be uh, an entrepreneur, a business owner, to be the person in charge of building and, and building a business. But at the same time, there were other, when I, there were other opportunities that came along that were worthwhile for me to go do, you know, working for somebody else. And so I see that in a lot of young people's careers is that, that this, this idea that you're, that you're going to come out of school and immediately start a business with no experience and no resources, you know, that it, it, it's not that you won't learn. It will be a great, you know, it'll be an experience, but it's not likely to be very successful. Whereas if you went to work for somebody in a growing business, somebody who'll give you a lot of responsibility fast and let you you learn and fail and pick up, uh, that experience may be much more valuable to you early on than actually owning your own business. And there will be an opportunity, a time where you can own your own business. And so, um, uh, so I think it's it's a balancing. I, I think the most important thing coming out of school was getting the opportunity to learn how how the marketplace actually, you know, how you fit in. What what are the skills you need? How do you how do you make a profit? How do you build a team? How do you serve a customer? Those are things that you don't necessarily learn at the same when you're in college. You know, when you get out past the college experience, you're kind of in the deep water now. And it's time to learn how the real world works. And, you know, it's nice to have a safety net of somebody who's paying you a salary while you're getting all of this free education in the marketplace. And a discussion that has been ongoing recently is the fact that I mean, it's good to get internship because it provides you with an opportunity to learn. And these are some of the skills that you'll later um, utilize when you're starting your own business. And the beauty about being an entrepreneur and starting business is that it gives you an opportunity to impact people's lives. It gives you an opportunity to change people's lives and even empower them. Right? But then nowadays, it's like if I'm a college student, I want an internship because it's going to provide me the opportunity to learn. But at the same time, I want to get paid, right? Because sure. nowadays we're also seeing a rise of opportunities where students and they're not getting paid, right? And well, they're told payment is the fact that you know you get to learn. And I would understand back in the days that people would just take such opportunities for the sake of learning, but now things are evolving and it's different. Is this happening because young people are not curious enough or they are not as hungry or as driven as how people used to be back in the days or they just have to get paid in as much as they're learning? You know, I don't think I don't think young people today are any less hungry or ambitious or hardworking than anybody in earlier generations. I, I don't really buy that. I also don't think that uh, that drive, that ambition is universal across the whole population. You know, so I think it's, it's, you know, the people who succeed have always been a small percentage of the total. And so, um, so, you know, whether you're, you know, 70 years old or you're 20 years old, um, the question is, are you one, one of the people that will pay the price are driven enough to, to learn and to, to uh, you know, accomplish your dreams. I think that um, you know certainly you have to make money. You know you have to be able to support yourself. At the same time, if you don't, you have to get practical experience doing something. Now, ideally, you get a job working for somebody who pays you enough money to support yourself. You know that's pretty critical. So you know. Having a job that pays you, allows you to support yourself is an important priority, but that has to be balanced against, am I working someplace where I'm actually learning some skills and getting some experience that I can leverage on to go to the next set of responsibilities? It's about 
climbing, we measure the success of the young people we work with by are they capable of res assuming great responsibility early in their career? And when we talk about that, you know, is we're talking about people who have significant positions of responsibility before they're 30 or before they're 35. Now, that doesn't mean that in the first two or three years when you come out of university, the truth is you have almost no marketable skills or most, most people don't. So you almost have to do whatever you can to both make a living and begin to learn what it's like to be out of school and to be in the marketplace and to learn what it is you like to do, what are you good at, where are the opportunities. It's, it's, um, it's a lot of thrashing around of looking for the right opportunities that's a combination of compensation as well as learning experience. But what we've seen with the young people we work with is that the fact that they thrash around for the first few years after they get out of, out of college, that's pretty common with everybody. The question is three to five years after you're out of college, have you learned enough have you gained the respect of enough people that people will give you significant responsibilities much younger than normal? And so we, when we look at Bridge for Wanda scholars and we look at Asomo scholars, we look at people that we've worked with from high school through college into the career. What we really look at, the way we measure success is at the, at the age of the late 20s or the early 30s, is this individual in a position of responsibility that probably is greater than most people at their age are? That's really the test. And so if you're able to assume significant responsibilities, then you have the skill sets. Now you can choose what you wanna do. You, you have a chance to go to work for somebody else that will pay you well to build something with them, part of them, or you have a chance to start something of your own. And maybe you can attract people who want to come along with you. But, you know, um, success doesn't, in typical, doesn't happen in the first two, three, four years out of college. People are still struggling. It's like being a college freshman. That first year or so is a period figuring it out, getting your feet on the ground, understanding what you have to offer, what people are offering, what's the real world really value. It takes a while to get that experience. But then the question is, are you hardworking enough, responsible enough, smart enough, committed enough that people will entrust responsibility to you early on? And so, um, so you know, we, we, um, we believe that the future of Rwanda and of Africa is a function of those talented young people who have the ability to assume great responsibility early in their career. I think, you know, I would, I, it would be has, I need to, to say that that was always very important to me. And in my first 20, 30 years of my career after college is gaining that responsibility and being able to assume more and more responsibility for businesses and teams and customers. What I came to relatively late in life was the idea that my life and the work that I did could be uh, lead to an improvement in the lives of others. You know, I was pretty focused the first 20, 30 years on my career, on my family, on my progress. Um, I realized at about the age of 50 that. Um, that that's not enough, that if you want to stay motivated, if you want to have purpose, if you want to live a life of meaning, then you need to use your some of your time, talent, and resources in such a way that it improves the lives of other people. And I think that's what I'm inspired by, by uh, younger people today, is that, you know, when I was when I was in my twenties, I was not terribly concerned about the world or about poor people or about people who didn't, you know, have 
the drive. I was interested in building, you know, attracting the most talented, most driven, most capable people, building teams and building businesses. When when I got to be 50, I realized that 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 I had the capacity through business and through developing other people to actually impact the lives of a lot more people. And that, that's, that's what led me to Rwanda. That's what led me to working with a microfinance bank. That's what eventually led me to working with the B2R scholars uh, is that business and these activities actually could be a catalyst to lift up lots of people's lives and improve lots of people's lives. And I think that what I admire about young people today is they want to do both. They want to be professionally excellent. They want to be masters of their craft. They want to be as good as anybody. They want to be as successful. But at the same time, they want their life to make a difference in the world. They want to know that the, the impact they're making is lifting up others or it's improving the economy or it's improving the environment or, you know, that there's a bigger cause out there besides their own personal success that they live for. And that the young people I've, I've worked with in today are people who, you know, they're not going to wait till they're 50 to figure that out. They want to build businesses in their 20s and their 30s, or they want to be a doctor, or they want to be a government leader, or they want to be a teacher, but that they want to be great at their profession. They want to be as good as anybody, but they also want to work in a context by which they see the impact of their life having a positive influence on the world. And I, I'm a huge admirer of that. I mean, it's definitely is beautiful because at the end of the day, the question is, what are you doing for somebody else? Yeah, absolutely. And it's good that young yeah. people are now thinking about that at an early age. Yes. And it, it's not an either or game. In other words, um, a lot of people of my generation, of the boomer generation, you know, we, we settled into careers of becoming really good at what we did and doing as well as we could but with very little thought to what we were, what we doing impacting other people's lives. And what I realized as I got further into my career is the ability to pull together resources, to organize people, to address problems was something that, that I could do, that I was developing a skill set and a capacity to do that. And yet I wasn't focusing those efforts on things that helped others you know, help my community, help my country, you know, and that, that there's not a reason you, you can't do both at the same time and that you can start very early. And so, um, so that, you know, that's, that's probably the biggest, if I had to do things over, I would have thought more about how, what I was building and what I was doing was it impacting a broader group of people and I think also, um, I think when you work in, in, a, in Africa, you work in a, an economy where there are significant differences between economic levels, education levels. There's more, there, you know, it's the, uh, the needs of the society, of the community are more obvious. They're more aware. Growing up in America, you know, people who, you know, we assume the government was going to take care of other people. And, you know, but the truth is we all have a role and a responsibility to, to manage our lives and invest our time and energy that lifts up other people. And I think that um, it's one of the things I admire about Rwanda is a sense of, um, of lifting up everyone, you know, that, that whether it's education or it's healthcare or it's infrastructure, it's other issues, you know, this, these are, these are imagined, these are strategically developed to lift up everybody in the population. And, um, and that can be true about private enterprises as well. And that speaks to the whole of Africa in a way, because Africans believe in the value of a community. 
right? We don't believe yes. that we exist as an individual. We exist at the community level. And it's good that these principles are also being executed when it comes to business, solving problems and starting companies. Right. Yeah, that, there is, um, there's definitely a cultural distinction between the world I grew up in the United States and Africa, this sense of, of responsibility and community and the idea that uh, we share, you know, that we, we know that our life and our activities and our successes and stuff will affect other people, that there's a ripple effect through that we have a responsibility to be aware of. And I'm, I'm, I think that's, that's a very healthy way to live. And I think it's, it's something that should be encouraged. Elion, when you're speaking about students who graduate from college and the fact that they have to be able to take on greater responsibilities, that speaks a lot to college students and those who have graduated, right? The fact that what should the goal of your education be, right? And I think if I, if I get it correctly from what you said earlier, I think the goal should be, first of all, to ensure that you are learning and then you are gaining experience. And finally, you're able to take on greater responsibilities when you graduate. Because most of the times as college students, we get locked up in the whole idea of what am I studying and what would I do after I graduate, given what I'm currently studying, right? And then at the end of the sure. day, it's like, just go study. And then when you're out there, we'll figure out what works because most of the times people really don't get into the careers that they are studying for when they're in college. Sure. Yeah, I you know, I'm I have become a, an admirer of AOU and the uh, culture that it's developed of in, of pressing young people to figure out what they want to be, what problems they want to solve, what challenges they want to be part of, and and having some input into designing their education to equip them to do that. I think, um, you know, the real learning begins when you, when you leave college and you begin trying to do this in the real world. But I do think that, um, that the purpose of education is to equip and prepare people to solve problems, to be able to, to look at the world and identify needs and opportunities and challenges and assess your own, what is it that you're attracted to? I, I, I believe in individual passion and drive and talents. I think that it's extremely important in an individual's progress that they get as much clarity about their own talents their own passions, their own drives as possible because they will find their greatest rewards, their greatest development in pursuing those things. And, um, you know, you learn in a variety of different ways. You can read a book, you can watch a video, you can go out and work in a, in a particular activity. Um, you know, you can, you may think that you want to do something in communications and podcasts, well, doing something like what you're doing in a podcast is a way of assessing, is this something you really like? Is this something you want to master? Or that you see people out there doing this that do it, obviously have done it a lot longer, do it better. Do you want to be as good as they, them? Does that, does that stir up a drive and an energy and an a, a imagination that says, yes, that's what I want to do? Just as likely you get involved in it and you find out, that's really not what I care about. That is not exactly. It's more, you know, it's as important to learn what you don't want to do as it is what you do want to do. And the process of, of getting better and, you know, is continually narrowing those things that really do uh, where your talents and your skill sets, your personality that, that those things that you don't necessarily control that you find out that that's really what you want to do. And, and really through trial and error and experiences is how you determine that. Um, and, you know, what I've discovered over a 40 year career or longer is that, you know, my, my area of interest continues to shrink 
hopefully the things that I still do at, I do pretty well because I've been doing it for a long time. But there are a lot more and more things that I've chosen not to be participate, you know, not to do. That it doesn't really, um, it does it, it. You know, I can't really be very good at it, so I don't want to do it. Um, so I think that that um, that's the purpose of education is to to make you realize that experimentation is good, that problem solving is good, um, and that you know learning to fail and learning the lessons of what failing teaches you um, that that's part of the process and, and that um, um, you know the lessons the things that you did in college begin to set the platform for much more significant meaningful failures and lessons learned when you get into uh, a career and it's also important to understand that you don't have to do one thing throughout your whole life you could literally change and pivot anytime when you feel like you know what i wanted to specialize in podcasting but nah, i don't think that's the case you know after five years then you have another opportunity to go out explore and find something else that you love doing and you enjoy doing and it's also creating an impact to the people who are around you and just doing it yeah yeah i i would say that that you um I, i've been fortunate to pursue my passion and i came to a realization that that I, I can pursue something passionately for a number of years. And then all of a sudden, I just don't care about it as much. And I came to the conclusion after 20, 30 years that passion is a gift from God. That it's not something that you create. It's not necessarily something uh, that you are responsible for making. It's just all of a sudden something lands in your lap is in front of you an opportunity exists and you care you really want to do it you really want to get better at it you want to experience it and you may do that for many many years and to master some skills and gain experience but then you'll just wake up one day and think i've kind of done everything i want to do here and you know once you lose that passion you can't get it back it's very difficult once you you've lost it and that's when you know you you go you pray a lot and say okay god what what's the next thing i mean i went from being a corporate tax expert in my 20s uh in early 30s to kind of getting a point where i went from being somebody who worked 60 70 hours a week was driven and was still and all of a sudden woke up one day and said i don't want to do this I want to be an investment banker. And I was passionate about that for six or seven years. And then I woke up one day and said, I've been on this train for a while. I don't want to do this anymore. I've learned what I want to learn from this experience. Now I want to be an entrepreneur. And I went out and bought a company. And I ran that company for six or seven years. And then it got to the point I learned how to build teams. I learned how to serve customers. I learned how to do a lot of things. And all of a sudden I woke up one day and said, I don't know that I want to keep doing this for another five years. And, you know, that's, um, you know, and I, I stopped, I sold the business and I said, what do I do now? And, um, and then when I was about 50 years old, I reached this point where I couldn't figure it out what was next. And that's when I met the Bishop from Rwanda. And he opened up a whole nother world for me to come to Rwanda and to Africa. And fortunately, um, I've stayed pretty passionate about Rwanda for almost 20 years now. So um, the, the job has changed. The work we do has changed over time. But um, you know, part of, part of what I've learned with Bridge to Rwanda is that there is a time and place for everything. There's a season. You know, there was a time when we were really focused on helping to start businesses. There was a time when we were focused on having, you know, young people, preparing young people to go get, study abroad. There are times today where um, I believe watching uh, schools like AOU that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, helping the students to get 
opportunities to study outside of Africa was an important challenge. It was something that needed to be proven and done. Today, I think that the, with the schools and the opportunities that exist on the continent, that that's no longer a, you know, necessary, that, that there is incredible talent and leadership and ability of young people that are going to great schools in Africa. And the question is, how do we help those students make that career, you know, that transition from college to career? So I think um, our priorities, the, the world changes and we change. And I think um, what I've learned in the, certainly in the second half of my life is that being, being flexible and adaptive to, to what doors open, what doors close, how the world changes, is that you're better off if you're, you're attracting talented people around you and constantly watching for what's the next opportunity, the next need, and can we, you know, is it fit something that we have the skills and the talent to do? So Bridge Rwanda has been a very evolutionary organization for the last um, 20, you know, 15 years. My hope is I'm not terribly concerned about the organization of Bridge Rwanda. What I'm, what I put my, you know, my hope in is the fellowship of young people who, ex who have an interaction with Bridge to Rwanda and who learn the value of fellowship, the value of improving the lives of other people, the values of getting results and working hard, that um, I have a lot of faith in the generation of young professional talent that we've been working with for the last 10 or 15 years and the talent we intend to work with in the next 10 or 15 years. I don't really know what the shape of the, the institution is or the organization is, but I have a huge faith that these individuals will be equipped to take on whatever challenges there are. And listening at how your life has transformed is just beautiful. Right, because in a way, it's like you've lived multiple lives. Yes, I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, you know, I've had a chance to do a lot of interesting things, and each step along the way taught me things and gave me experiences and introduced me to to people that that in the next season, in the next deal, have been very, very helpful. And I think uh, you know, God always has a plan, and we don't always see it. But, um, but, you know, if you're here for the long term and you, you know, you do the things that are in front of you, you take on the challenges, you get to do the best you can, you learn from it, you get results. And then you look up one day and, and this is not what you're supposed to do. There's another, that door closes, another door opens. And that um, uh, I don't operate life with a strategic plan anymore. You know, I, I, it's all about individuals and teams and talents and then organizing those resources, those people to take on a challenge that we are uniquely equipped to do and, um, and then doing the best we can and then seeing what the world opens after that. Ultimately, it's really, I mean, ultimately, it really is about living in the moment, right? Not worrying about the past and, you know, being nervous about the future just live in the present. If this is something that you enjoy doing, just go for it. Just do it. You lose interest. Yeah. It's okay. Find something else and then do it. And 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 we are really stuck in the future and saying, you know what? Now I'm studying entrepreneurship. What's next? What am I going to do after I graduate, right? And <laughs> most of the times it's right there with us, right? What are you passionate about right now? What is it that interests you? What is it that you find really fascinating working about and just go and do right. that thing. And then the moment you lose interest, find something else because they say specialization is for insects. <laughs> <laughs> well, it may be, you know, it's interesting because I do think there, there are periods of your life where you're really interested in something and you want to master a skill. You get very narrowly focused on learning that or doing that, but there will be a point where, that season is over and you look up and you, you look for something else. And, and, um, and I do think that, um, you know, 
not being terribly concerned about um, defining success. I think success is is identifying those things you are passionate about, that you care about, and more important, that you have a skill that you know that that plays to your strengths, and also helps you make a living. I mean, we have to live in a real world, you know. You have to figure out how to make a living for yourself. That's the first priority. But then the question is, can you figure out how to make a living for yourself doing something that you really want to do or you really want to learn? And, and um, you know, once you find that season, then you kind of double down on it and play it as hard as you can until you've learned what you needed to learn or another opportunity comes along. But um yeah, when looking back, it's it's life seems very unpredictable. You know, when I look at at the jobs I've had, the careers I've had, the businesses I've built, the whole engagement in Rwanda. These were things I could never have imagined at 20 or 25 or 35 or 45. You know, life continued to open doors that I could not have managed. So I, I trust less on trying to define what success is going to look like in 10 or 20 years or um, or trying to strategically lay out a plan. Um, on one hand, I think about those things all the time. On the other hand, I trust them less all the time, too, because I realize how unpredictable life is. It really is. And that is something that we young people do not understand, or at least cannot grasp. <laughs> right? We think it yeah. should be planned. We need to have a layer, a good, well layered plan saying that, you know what, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to do this job in the next five years. I'm going to, I don't know, build a house, you know, get, get married, get kids. And we lay out the whole thing, not knowing that, you know, it, it's really, it's hard to predict the future or to plan for it. Yeah. Right. And, the best way is really to take it as it comes. You sure. can only plan for like well, a year or two, but I mean, 10 years down the line, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. hard. Well, you have to realize life, it, as a child, as a young person, as a youth, life is pretty organized. You know, everybody starts school at five or six years old or sometimes a little younger. And then you move up one grade at a time, one year at a time from the age of six all the way into your early 20s. You know, if most people define what is life, it is I'm going to do the work in the second grade so I can go to the third grade and from the third to the fourth and from primary to secondary. And so life is like, um, it's like painting by the numbers. You know, everybody has the same game plan. Everybody measures success in the same way. All the way from the time you start school as a young child, to when you finish university, pretty much everybody follows the same rules about what is success and what, and how are we going to define, was this a good year or not a good year? But all of a sudden at 22 or three or four, when you finish university, you're given a big blank canvas that says life, you know, life is going to follow a path that's unpredictable. And your success is not going to be the same as someone else's success. And the number of years you spend doing this may be very different than what somebody else does. That wasn't true for the first 20 plus years of your life. So that's one of the reasons the transition from university to the marketplace and to the profession is so exciting and so sloppy and so scary is that you don't have, people have not laid out a year by year success plan. Um, mm-hmm. I, when I went to work, I went to work for an accounting firm where you start out as an assistant and then every year you get promoted up until you eventually make partner. And I made partner at KPMG when I was 30 years old. And I realized that I had been promoted every year of my life from the time I was five years old until I was 30 years old. There was always a very clear goal about how I was going to measure success and whether or not I was going to be successful from one year to the next until I was 30. 
And then at 30, it was like, you know, I don't really want to do this. I mean, I don't want to do this plan anymore. I want to allow, you know, my own personal creativity, my own passions, my own interests to dictate how I'm going to measure, how what I'm going to work on and how I'm going to measure success. It's a good it's a good explanation of why most people become nervous when they graduate from college because <laughs> they always have a plan, right? You know, grade one to all the way until you go to college and you graduate. And then the challenge comes when you graduate because, well, now you don't have any plan layout for you, right? So you, right. Years, you knew that you had a plan. So you move from here to here to here and you knew how you could define success. And then boom, all of a sudden, it's a blank canvas. No right. direction. No and that's, that's the reason so many people start exploring graduate school because it gives you a chance to get back on a way of measuring <laughs> success that you're comfortable with. And you know, you know, that, yeah. that being out there on that blank canvas is a very scary place to be. Indeed. It's very scary. And so, you know, if I want to get more comfortable, I can go get into a grad, a graduate school program and get my master's. The the the, real, the the reality is though when you get the masters you're right back out on the blank canvas again, and so you know you can that's... delay it. I mean, and I I think a lot of people go to graduate. School. I think people go into PhD programs, who actually who have the ability to do it. They have the academic talent, but the truth is, that is not necessarily what they want their life to look like. But it's so comfortable of getting into a four or five or six year PhD program and just keep adding on. You know, if you're good at school, then you want to stay there as long as you can because it makes life easy to to define and it's comfortable. Whereas the path, path is clear. Whereas if you want to be an innovative, creative, entrepreneurial individual who defines their own life, who sets their own goals, who measures their own success, it's a scary place. And yet it is the most invigorating way to live is that nobody tells you how to define success. Nobody tells you that you should work in this job or that you should get promoted here or that you need to learn this skill set. You have to be, you have to look down deep inside and say, what do you really want to do? And nobody's probably ever asked you that because your parents told you you needed to go to be successful in school and go to college and get your degree. And get a you good know, job. <laughs> get a good job. Yeah, exactly. And hopefully it'll be a job that won't you won't have to figure it out. Nobody will tell you how you're going to measure success. Yeah. It's not that, you know. It's really it's, fascinating um, to think of it that way. Yeah. Right. Because even right now, for most students, when they graduate college, the, the the best option for them is just to go for grad school, right? Because they don't yes. have to think about the future because, well, I'm just going to go and study that. You know, I have everything laid out for me and I just have to follow it and I'll be fine. But then when they think right. about, you know what, I've graduated now, I have to go out in the real world. It's very scary. Yeah, right. But, you know, it's a matter of, it's, it is this issue of security versus uh, the courage to go into the unknown. You know, th there is something very valuable about faith in the fact that if you really do believe that God's got your hand in his life, you know, your life in his hand, and there is a plan, you have to go discover it, is that it takes the fear away. One of the, the tenets of faith is that you should live life with no fear. Because you have confidence that there is a path for you that's already been laid out that you will discover. And that you, when you get to these dilemmas, these, these, you know, whys in the road, where do you take the one that's where the path and success is more clearly defined by somebody else? Or do you strike out onto a blank canvas because you have confidence that a plan has already been designed for your life and that you will find it and you will fulfill it and that you don't have any reason to be afraid? 
I hope if we have any college students listening to this right now, at least when they graduate, they'll probably want to take a year out to figure out what they want to do or just to explore the unknown because the fear of unknown is massive and the escape <laughs> route is just to go for grad school. Even if you don't know what you want to study, just, just go to school again. Sure. Yeah, we tell you, I mean, I think graduate school for the right purposes is could be a wonderful thing. But um, when you see when you see somebody finish undergraduate school and almost immediately begin looking for graduate programs, it says to me that they're too scared to go explore the world for a while. Is that they need the comfort, they need the comfort of having a more clearly defined path and a definition of success. And it doesn't mean, I, I've never discouraged anybody from going to grad school. If they've gone into the world and they've gotten a deeper understanding of what they really care about and what they're really good at and what they want to do. If, if getting a master's or a PhD is valuable to accomplish the things they've discovered about themselves, it's a wonderful thing. But that's not true about most people is that they they choose to go that path because it's more comfortable before they have really been willing to take the risk, to step off the edge, to go to the edge of uncertainty and to live life out there. We have a, a saying at Bridge to Rwanda that we, we like to move to the edge of uncertainty in our life because it is in those places that you really see miracles happen. And that once you see miracles happen, then it, going to the edge is very addictive. And it is at going to the edge that you really realize your true potential and what you're capable of. Right. You will not know that until you're willing to go out to the edge of uncertainty. You can't find that out in your comfort zone. Thank you so much for coming. I mean, this has been quite an interesting conversation and I'm glad we could finally pull it off. Thank you to Bavu for making this happen. And I, I really sure. love the conversation. This was amazing. Good. I have too. This has been great. Hope Thank to you. do that with a lot more ALU students. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so All much. Right. And I hope Thank you, you in touch. You will. Stay in touch. Let me know what you do after graduation. Most definitely. I'll let you know. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Okay,